All right, so let's hit the pulmonary antibiotic. So you guys are all antibiotic out, but guess what? They come back again and again. It's like pet cemetery, but pet antibiotics. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk about bronchitis. Uh, have you guys covered any of this stuff yet? Good. Okay, so bronchitis. What is it usually caused by? Viruses. Okay, this is a common reason to uh, inappropriately prescribe antibiotics. We don't like to do this. We don't need to. Uh, but basically what we're seeing here, bronchitis, as you might imagine, is the itis of the bronchi, right? So it's the inflammation that you're seeing there. Uh, again, generally, it's not going to get more involved than that. If it we're kind of getting down into the, more of the bronchioles and alveoli, you'd call that kind of what? more turns like a pneumonia at that point, right? So when it gets kind of more deep-seated than that. Uh, certainly there's a, a acute bronchitis that, you know, can affect people of all ages. Um, when do you normally see acute bronchitis? What time of year? Yeah, fall, winter time. Yeah, it's when you typically see a lot of these respiratory viruses start, start to make a, a comeback. Um, chronic ones, you're typically see chronic bronchitis going to be more of your COPD patients, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So uh, again, common in the winter months, typically begins as some sort of upper respiratory tract infection, which can then become like a secondary sort of bronchitis. Um, coughing is going to be associated with this, typically kind of non-productive at first, and then you can see kind of more mucopurulent kind of sputum being produced there, plus or minus fever, you may hear some stuff on that uh, on lung exam. And again, typically checks x-rays are normal because you don't really get a lot of that alveolar involvement going on there, okay? And again, I'm not going to get super in-depth on the diagnosis. I just want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page when we get into how we're going to be treating this. As we mentioned, most of the time it's going to be viral, right? So does that mean most of the time should we be treating with drugs? No, but again, you're going to find that a lot of people, when they go in and they got a bronchitis and they're going in to see the PA or the physician, what do they want to leave with? Drugs. They want to leave with a prescription, but you're going to say, no, I'm a better PA than that. I'm not going to do it. Typically, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, influenza occasionally. And again, this is why like this time of year, we're starting to get more flu tests that are being done. You can do more flu swabs to see if people are positive for that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to uh, the antiviral section. We'll talk about the Tamiflu, the drug we use for that. We're focusing mainly on the bacterial side of things right now. Um, if it is going to be bacterial, and again, only occasionally is it going to be so, um, we have drugs like or bugs start to pop up like mycoplasma, pneumonia, chlamydia, bordetella. What do you kind of notice about these bacteria? But how would you classify those? Atypical bugs, right? So now we're starting to see more atypicals. You didn't see a ton of those in the upper respiratory tract. You saw a lot of like strep pneumo, H flu, Mark Salic, Hateralis. Now that we're getting deeper in the respiratory tract, you're seeing more atypicals show up here, okay? Also, some gram positives can show up, like streptococcus, staphylococcus, and then H flu um, can also be uh, present here as well. Sometimes what you'll find is the patients will start off with like a viral illness, and they'll get kind of a secondary bacterial illness that will kind of evolve into. Um, so just be aware that, you know, um, if it's typically a pr more protracted kind of course, you may start to think, you know, towards the end of that, hey, it's maybe more likely to be bacterial. Um, generally self-limited, mostly you can use supportive care to treat these patients. You know, we can use things like analgesics, we can use antipyretics. What are some examples of those we could use? Patient's got a fever, I say, hey, what can, what can you recommend? Tylenol, Motrin, ibuprofen, like that, those are all good options there, right? Uh, antitussives like... Cody, I, well, that's, that's kind of nice of you guys. I don't know if I'd, <laughs> I'm going to come to you if you guys have any drugs. What else could we use? Uh, yeah, so Tesselon Pearl, like Benzonitate. Yeah, Robitussin or Dextromethorphan, uh, Dextromethorphan, that is over the counter. That's usually the kind of the go-to. It's going to be probably the cheapest thing for a lot of people to get. Good. Uh, make sure they stay nice and well hydrated, too. That's the other big thing you don't want to, to have occur. Especially if they're trying to hack up a lot of mucus, like you don't want them to get dried out because that becomes more viscous. It becomes more difficult for it to expectorate. So, again, that's why we kind of mentioned, hey, stay hydrated as much as you can. Typically avoid antihistamines because, again, what do they typically do to your secretions? They dry out, right? So we don't necessarily want to make that, the, that mucus any more viscous than we need to. Okay, maybe may prolong symptoms in some cases. Uh, so routinely, antibiotics are not going to be recommended. Again, if it's, say, greater than five days, at that point, you can start to consider more bacterial involvement going on here. As far as drugs go, we're going to focus on things that are going to be able to get some of those gram positives and gram negatives, kind of a limited spectrum, but we also want to encompass our atypicals. Okay, so this is why the antibiotic choice here is going to differ than what we'd see like in otitis media or like a strep pharyngitis, right? Now we're going to start to see things like doxycycline is going to be um, uh, preferred here, right? Doxy is going to be able to get kind of that, that you know, limited range of gram positive and negatives, but now we pick up atypicals, okay? This is preferred unless you work in an area where mycoplasma is more, more documented. Um, or we're starting to use this a little bit more because macrolide resistance is becoming more of an issue for, for this. So you're starting to see more doxycycline being used here. Um, but as far as macrolides go, and a lot of people like to use azithromycin because the dosing is super easy. Have you guys covered that at all yet? 
any other classes. Yeah, I'm not going to quiz you on the dosing necessarily, but you ever heard of a Z-Pack? You don't even have to write a dose on there. You just say, hey, take a Z-Pack, use a direct, and you're done, right? Super easy, but that's again, also leads people to overprescribe it, and we run into resistance problems, right? Azithromycin is going to be the most common one to be used here. Um, certainly, erith uh, erythromycin can be used occasionally. See a lot of GI cramps with that and things. Um, we'll talk more about that in the GI section later in this class, but clarithromycin could also be used as well, right? You guys remember how macrolides work? Protein synthesis, yeah, absolutely good. Um, and then potentially you could use what we call like a respiratory fluoroquinolone. Um, usually you're going to see things like uh, potentially Cipro, levofloxacin are going to be used here. Now we want to avoid using these. These are kind of a little too broad spectrum for us. We want to hold back on them if we can, uh, unless you have uh, documented resistance uh, against or risk of resistance to strep pneumo, right? So if they've been on previous antibiotic courses. If you're worried about them having resistant strep pneumo where uh, azithromycin might not get it, doxy might not get it, that's where we can start to consider using something like a fluoroquinolone, okay? So again, it should not be your first line, your go-to. Azithromycin is probably going to be the go-to for a lot of practitioners, but doxy is kind of a, a backup. Okay. So then moving on, so again, this kind of bridges nicely into talking about pneumonia. And so there's several varieties of pneumonia. So we have community acquired, which typically means what? Outside the hospital, they're coming in off the street, they got a pneumonia developing, right? So we have hospital acquired pneumonia. Are there any like subcategories of that? Ventilator associated pneumonia. Say so healthcare associated pneumonia. What's the difference there? What do you think? Uh, possibly that could be that could be a healthcare associated pneumonia certainly. Uh, not necessarily. Think about like nursing homes. Think about like long-term care facilities, things like that. That's where we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so like a lot of nursing home patients, you know, get these pneumonias, and we consider those to be healthcare associated pneumonias, right? So the nomenclature is not super important, but we'll we'll make uh, mention of it when we get to it, especially like the ventilator versus, you know, uh, just community acquired. You know, we'll talk about those differences there. So anywho, typically the respiratory tract is very good about uh, getting rid of gunk, right? We have these nice ciliated epithelia. We can just kind of constantly just kind of be uh, shuttling things up towards the oropharynx. Um, what type of patients would have dysfunctions with this, do you think? Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, yeah. What happens with those guys, do you know? Yeah, very thick mucus. Yeah, the stuff that gets like just more gunky than you can imagine. It's almost, almost like cement practically. Um, those, yeah, those have problems. Who else? Who's more common you're going to run into? Smokers. Smokers, yeah. Inhaling hot, hot gas. And it doesn't have to be cigarettes. It could be, um, you know, it could be crack cocaine. It could be marijuana uh, that they've been smoking. All of that hot gas in the lungs can damage it over time, right? Not only uh, can you have this kind of dysfunction uh, and, and this inability to clear things from the lungs, which can predispose you to uh, things like bacterial infection, but also what does it predispose you to? Cancer, yeah, lung cancer is going to be the other big thing we're worried about there. But anyway, typically your respiratory tract is very sterile, right? You want to keep it sterile because, again, this is uh, very easy for bacteria to, you know, kind of cross over from the alveoli into the bloodstream. You can see um, kind of this hematogenous spread that can occur. Uh, so we want to keep it sterile, as sterile as possible. And so when you see disruption there, that's when we can hit some issues. So microbes enter via a variety of different pathways. So certainly you can see this with aspiration from the oropharynx. So again, you can see things like, you know, um, gut content can be aspirated down to the respiratory tract. That can be one means for that to occur. Um, why do you think it's more common in the elderly? So you get older, they may not be uh, as with it mentally. They may not be protecting their airway as well, right? So me and you, we can protect our airway very well. We're awake, alert, oriented. Um, but as they get older, you know, especially like late stage dementias and things like that, they may not be protecting their airway so well. And that's where you can see that kind of uh, aspiration. Um, similarly, people who are drunk or people who are on medications that depress the mental status, that can also lead to aspiration as well. Again, when you're kind of on that scene as depressed, you can see that, that aspiration occur. Um, certainly, if you have inhalation of uh, infectious aerosols, that can be a problem hematogenous dissemination, which I already mentioned. And then uh, occasionally you can have things like direct inoculation, if there's like trauma, any kind of piercing injury, things like that could occur there as well. So common features, uh, as you guys have already covered, as you have at least alluded to, uh, a lot of cough, fever, sputum being produced here. Typically dyspnea, tachypnea can happen here. Um, again, occasionally you can see things, especially like with these elderly patients, mental status changes. You know, is it their dementia is getting worse or is it because they have a bacterial infection that we're just now starting to pick up on, right? Chest pain can occur here as well. And it was kind of the gold standard for diagnosing a pneumonia. Uh, 
chest x-ray. And again, um, I'm no good with chest x-rays, like uh, obviously just not my, my training. Um, but if I can look at a, an x-ray and I can say, yeah, that, that looks like a pneumonia, it's probably a pretty bad pneumonia, I can tell you. Um, I can pick up like a completely collapsed lung. That's one thing I can pick up. And then if they have a massive like empyema or something, that I can see. Anything else, I'm like, I have no idea. It looks like they have lungs, I guess. Um, <laughs> But anyway, the, the benefit here is it can it can confirm presence of, of infiltrates. You know, you can look for things like atelectasis, which can occur here as well. Keep in mind, this uh, can be uh, kind of misrepresentative, especially with patients who have poor immune systems, because if they don't really have a good immune system to kind of cause a lot of inflammation, cause a lot of that kind of that whiteout that occurs there in the chest X-ray, you may be maybe normal. So you know, one caveat to think about there. So. Question is when you have a patient who who you suspect has uh, pneumonia, so you say you know that really junky sounding lung exam, you get the chest X-ray and it looks like they have pneumonia. The question is, well, where do I manage them at, right? Um, so uh, your uh, disposition of the patient is just as important as making your diagnosis. Like, do they? stay outpatient? Do I need to bring them into the hospital? And which therapy you choose for them is going to be very dependent on that as well, right? So typically outpatient therapy, what type of meds am I going to be giving them as far as route goes? Probably PO, right? Because it doesn't make sense to send someone out on IV medications, right? It's not typically done. However, if they're sick enough to warrant an admission, typically they're going to be getting uh, IV medications. So sort of think about those sort of things like, you know, how sick are they? Are they able to tolerate oral medications? Well, if they can't, then they probably need to come in. You know, those are kind of the decisions you're going to be making there. Now, as far as outpatient management goes, patients typically do pretty well with empiric antibiotic, antibiotics. Um, you know, you typically don't need to get cultures for all these patients, right? And again, what type of cultures do we typically get? Sputum cultures. Are those particularly um, reliable? Why not? Exactly. If you're, just, you're just getting spit in a lot of times, right? So especially like if you look at a sputum sample and there's a lot of epithelial cells, that just kind of tells you it's spit. And, and it's not super useful. Because again, what kind of bugs are growing in your mouth? All kinds of stuff. You have your grand positive, some, some anaerobes and different things like that. So just because you culture out something from that sputum sample does not mean that's what was deep down in the actual lungs. What's kind of the gold standard for getting like a good um, uh, uh, culture from the lungs? <laughs> Yeah, usually a bronchoscopy uh, where you do a bronchial alve alveolar lavage. Uh, uh, and so basically you can just uh, send the patient to tip it intubated, put down a, a bronchoscope, and you can basically just kind of wash out some of that fluid, some of that mucus and stuff, pick it back up, and then you can culture that. And that's typically like kind of the gold standard there. So again, just be aware of sputum samples. Not always going to be super good. Also, keep in mind, like, when did they get antibiotics versus when did you pull that culture? And which one should you do first? Culture is always first because what happens if I give antibiotics first? You might start killing with bacteria. You may not actually culture out anything. So at that point, it's hard to say, did I um, just, you know, did the antibiotics interfere here or did they not actually have any bacteria that I'm worried about in the first place? So again, that's why you always, as long as it's within, within reason, do your cultures first. So I mentioned, um, you know, oftentimes that expectorated sputum is, is, is contaminated. You may not always uh, identify that, that responsible pathogen. So um, as far as you know, where you send the patient to, so say, you know, if you're deciding between outpatient versus inpatient, have you guys covered things like CURB-65 or that pneumonia severity index? I'm not going to go super in depth on those, but just be aware that this is part of your decision making process. You know, do they need to go to the ICU? Can they just go to the med search for it? What kind of monitoring do they need? How intensive does their care really need to be? And that, those are decisions you're going to be making. But again, I should, uh, say just to, to you know, try to get a complete picture here. So. Um, Looking at the type of bugs we're going to be seeing here, and again, you don't need to know specifically each individual bug on this list, but look at the general categories of things we're running into. And we've seen a lot of these already when we covered the ENT section, right? For outpatient, strep pneumo is rearing his ugly head again. We start to see these atypical bugs start to pop up again, like mycoplasma. We see H flu come up again, Marxella cataralis. Uh, a lot of viruses as well, right? So again, that's why it's important we're, we're trying to evaluate whether this is really bacterial or not. When they get into the inpatient side, you're starting to worry about more kind of virulent kind of bacteria. This is where you can start to see things like uh, mycoplasma again, but now we have things like chlamydia popping up. We have things like Legionella, these other kind of atypicals. And so again, your coverage and what type of drugs you're going to use changes a little bit based on kind of where they're at, whether outpatient, inpatient, or if they're in ICU. Um, does anyone know where Legionella got its name from? Right. The American Legion uh, was having a conference. And so, again, what's kind of the classic history when you think Legionella? Like, yeah, air conditioning, like contaminated air systems and things like that. Yeah. Um, anyways, I was hoping you guys wouldn't know that, so I'm going to give you a cool piece of trivia, but oh well. Way to ruin it. Um, 
And then uh, when they get in the inpatient side, this is when you got to really worry about the, kind of the bad players here. So you start to worry about staph aureus, right? This is where you start to worry about these gram-negative bacilli, things like E. coli, things like uh, uh, pseudomonas starts to pop up again. And so this is where we're going to use even more broad-spectrum therapy is we're going to use really the big guns here to, to start out with. And then as we get our cultures back, once you kind of figure out what's growing, we get sensitivities, then we can scale down therapy uh, pretty significantly, okay? So again, the more sick they are, the bigger the guns they're going to get, and then we can scale down based on their cultures. All right, so things that may predispose someone to having a particular pathogen. So these are things you're kind of evaluating in your patient and let you think, okay, I might be worrying about this kind of bug versus this kind of bug. For penicillin-resistant strep pneumo, if they're older than age 65, because again, older patients typically have comorbidities, maybe make them more uh, prone to some of these uh, resistant bugs. If they've received a beta-lactam within the past three months, what do you think that is? Yeah, you're basically putting selective pressure on those bacteria. And so, if, again, if you kill off a bunch of the uh, penicillin-susceptible uh, strep pneumo, but then all of a sudden now you have these resistant strains that are able to um, start to kind of creep up and they can make a, a, a you know a new... Um, basically the patient, their, their new home, essentially. Um, alcoholism, they tend to um, begin to have a kind of a depressed immune system, makes them a little bit more susceptible here. Immunosuppressed, obviously, like cancer patients and, and uh, HIV patients, things like that. And then really kind of any of these kind of chronic comorbidities, things like diabetes, things like renal insufficiency, congestive heart failure, cardi uh, coronary artery disease, malignancy, any of these things can predispose someone to having these more kind of resistant pathogens. Because again, if you think about it, where are these patients, you know, uh, how often are they getting care for their disease states? Probably a little more often than someone who's otherwise healthy, right? So again, they're being exposed more frequently. You can imagine why they might be more at risk here. And then why, why do you think it's uh, exposure to a child in daycare? These places are petri dishes. They're cesspools of disease, right? Uh, all those kids that are getting all these uh, snotty noses and, and, and otitis medias that are on recurrent courses of amoxicillin, guess what? They are breeding out super bugs uh, with you know, new strains every single day, right? So again, if you have exposure to a kid like that, they, again, are more likely to have spread that over to the, the, the patient. So again, all these things make them at risk for strep pneumo. This changes your course of therapy. And we'll talk about what those, cha uh, those changes are in just a few minutes. All right. Um, things that put someone at risk for enterogram negatives, if they're residing in a nursing home, right? This is where we're going to start to think about more of those healthcare associated pneumonias. Uh, any kind of underlying uh, cardiopulmonary disease, recent antibiotic therapy, those kind of medical comorbidities we mentioned in the last slide, again, those put you more at risk for those. And then pseudomonas, again, this is really the nasty player here. We're really worried about this bug for the sickest of patients. Um, any kind of structural lung disease, uh, corticosteroid use. And why do I put corticosteroid use? Yeah, cortical steroids are immunosuppressive, right? They're making it more favorable for these bacteria to, to uh, get a hold in the patient because you're depressing their immune system. Now, again, any broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy, because you're wiping out the normal flora, risk for these opportunistic bugs to, to come in. And then just malnutrition in general can put you at risk here. Because, again, you're don't not very well, uh, well nursed. You're probably not going to be uh, having a, as functional of an immune system as you would be otherwise. Okay. So... Looking at outpatient management, and again, these questions will come up, you know, how do I treat this patient? They're going to be managed on the outpatient side, and they have this history of antibiotic use, blah, blah, blah. Those are the kind of questions that will come up on, on the test for, for these, uh, these subjects here. Typically, if they have no risk for strep pneumo, based on those categories we've talked about previously, you can get away with just using something like a macrolide, right? So something like azithromycin, because again, we have decent enough coverage for strep pneumo, not the really resistant ones, but at least the kind of basic strep pneumo, and then we can cover our atypicals. That's a good coverage there. So azithromycin, clarithromycin, those are your kind of go-tos. Secondary to that, uh, if you wanted to, you could use something like doxycycline, minocycline. Why do you think we use like doxy, like kind of second line? It's pretty cheap. It's not really a big issue. There's more patients have contraindications to using it, right? So again, if you had a kid who had a pneumonia, you know, less than eight, you don't want to use doxycycline, right? Because you worry about what? He's staining if they're pregnant, you know, so things like that. Again, azithromycin is super easy. You don't have to worry about any kind of renal dosing. You just say, hey, take 500 to the first day, then you're going to take 250 for the next four days, and you're done, right? Super easy. People just automatically jump to that one. Um, again, I'm not going to question on dosing specifically. But uh, if they do have risk factors for strep pneuma, this is when we need to start considering things like potentially combination therapy. You might use two drugs instead of just one. Um, so this is where you would utilize things that have kind of synergistic mechanisms. Again, you don't want to use two beta-lactams at the same time because you don't really get any additional benefit there, right? Now we need to start using things that have multiple mechanisms to kind of work together. So we utilize, utilize a beta-lactam, so like our cephalosporins or penicillins, plus a macrolide that will get our atypicals, okay? 
So typically you can see amoxicillin kind of plus or minus clavulonic acid. Depends on, you know, what they've received previously. They've been on amoxicillin, you know, last month. Maybe switch it up to augmentin, right? Kind of bump them up a little bit. Um, and then you could also use like your second or third generation cephalosporins. Cephidoxime, ceftonia would also be a decent option here as well, okay? So you can use one of those plus uh, azithromycin typically, right? So that can be your combination therapy. Or instead of that, if you just want to use one drug, they'll still get that strep pneumo and still get those atypicals. You could just use a fluoroquinolone. But again, be careful switching over to the fluoroquinolones. Again, the more we use it, the more likely you see urgency resistance, so less likely it's going to be useful. They're typically more expensive too, and we see more side effects associated with those. So, so again, another reason why we kind of hold off on those when we can. But if they have a true beta-lactam allergy and they couldn't receive cephalosporins for whatever reason, this is another good alternative that we can use. Okay. All right, uh, when they're uh, coming into the hospital and they're gonna be non-ICU, so they're sick, but they're not quite sick enough to require uh, ICU care. Uh, this is when they're gonna require more parenteral therapy, right? We're giving them bigger doses, or not necessarily bigger doses, but we're giving it straight to the veins. Uh, they're getting higher concentrations because we don't have to worry about bioavailability and things like that. Typically, we're gonna start off with an intravenous beta-lactam. This is where we can use things like uh, third generation cephalosporins, like cefotaxime. Ceftriaxone is another really nice one because again, how often do you have to give ceftriaxone? or Ceftriax 1, one time a day. So again, that's another benefit of, of using that. Um, or you could use like a high-dose ampicillin because again, you're getting higher concentrations to overcome that resistance. Because again, if they're already coming into the hospital, they're sick enough, you are still worried about the resistance drug pneumo at that point, right? If they're sick enough to warrant an admission. Plus, at that point, you're going to be using either an intravenous or an oral macrolide. I will tell you that in general, um, we don't use a lot of IV macrolides. Most people will just get oral uh, azithromycin plus like an IV beta-lactam. Um, for whatever reason, it's just way more expensive to use IV macrolides. I mean, you don't need it in a lot of cases. Okay, So again, uh, I probably won't quiz you on that particular uh, question, but that's typically the way of things, how they go. Um, or instead of a macrolide, you could use something like doxycycline. Or again, we could use the, the respiratory fluoroquinolone. Okay, so those are kind of our options there. And then if they're in the ICU, it's going to be the same as the above, but again, um, preferentially using all IV therapy. And then we want to start to consider MRSA coverage, right? So again, that's where we get our more nasty kind of gram positives. And what do you think our go-to drug is for, for MRSA? Vancomycin is going to be our go-to workhorse gram positive killer. So again, with community-acquired MRSA, again, we're not talking about hospital-associated uh, or healthcare-associated pneumonias now. We're still talking about community-acquired MRSA. This is certainly on the rise. And the people you want to consider as possibly having one of these type of infections, if they have any kind of like cav uh, cavitary infiltrates uh, or they were, say, at risk for aspiration for whatever reason or if they've had a recent influenza, that tends to increase your risk for getting kind of a subsequent MRSA infection. Or if you do, say, your, your sputum culture uh, and you're seeing that they have, you know, kind of high yields of gram-positive cocci and clusters on the gram stain, that kind of gives you an idea that, yes, this is probably going to be MRSA. And again, it's either going to require off, most often vancomycin or potentially linazolid. You could use clinda, uh, clindamycin, because again, that will cover a lot of strains of MRSA. But the thing is, is that um, with these patients, they're sick enough to really, if you're worried about MRSA, we want to use a drug that's really kind of guaranteed to get that MRSA, kind of nip it in the bud. And then if we can narrow it down later, once we get the results back of the sensitivities, then we'll scale down, okay? So typically vancomycin, they couldn't receive that due to allergy or some other reason, then maybe linazolid, right? Start with those kind of big guns and then scale down if we can to something like clinda, uh, if it's feasible, right? Because you could come back with like an MSSA, and then you could use what type of drug at that point? Cephalosporins. You could use cephalosporins. Yeah, so something like nafcillin or dicloxacillin, those anti-staphylococcal penicillins, that actually are good options to, to, to scale down. So we'll do that occasionally if they were to come back with that. And again, we say nosocomial pneumonia. Again, what does that mean? Yeah, it's kind of health, associated with kind of healthcare. So this is typically going to be infections that the patients get um, that they did not come in with essentially. So maybe they're coming in for a total knee replacement and then they come up with a pneumonia say two days later. This is going to include all of those um, hospital acquired pneumonias, ventilators uh, acquired, healthcare associated, all kind of get lumped in these nosocomial pneumonias we're talking about here. This is probably the second most common infection in, in hospitalized patients after UTIs. And again, why do you think UTIs are so common? Catheters. Catheters, right. So anytime you're putting hardware into the patient, you're giving the bacteria a nice, easy way to get into the patient. That's going to be, uh, that's why ventilator-associated pneumonia is such a big deal. It's because you can have a big plastic tube going down your throat, like bacteria is just going to be traveling along that, no problem. Um, and also, what's the other problem? Like, so you're, you admit a patient for something, you know, say they come in for, uh, you know, a broken bone, uh, but now they get a, uh, a UTI or a pneumonia. What, why is that such a big deal? Mm, yes, hospital does not get reimbursed for that. Why is that? Yeah. 
Exactly right. So again, when you think about like Medicare, Medicaid, places like that, and you know, a lot of insurance companies will follow kind of what CMS does. Um, you know, if they came in for a broken bone and all of a sudden they get a pneumonia, they're like, well, we're paying you to fix that broken bone. Like you gave them the pneumonia. That's not our deal, right? So you only get so much reimbursement for that stuff. Uh, and so it's really at the hospital's um, inter best interest, uh, financially speaking, also for the patient um, to make sure they don't get these secondary infections. So uh, infection control is such a big deal. That's why we do a lot of like MRSA swaps for patients when they come in the hospital. Um, that's why we do a lot of like deep cleans and terminal cleans for those rooms. Um, so you hear a lot about that and a lot of, you know, campaigns for making sure you're washing your hands and, and different things like that. It's all related back to preventing these, the spread of infection, right? It's a big, big deal there. Higher mortality, bigger hospital costs. Okay, so these healthcare associated pneumonias, um, again, we're going to consider this to be people who develop these pneumonias if they're in a hospital uh, or acute care facility for greater than two days in the past 90 days. We still consider that to be healthcare associated. Um, if they were in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, Certainly, that would be considered uh, healthcare associated. Recent IV antibiotics, uh, recent chemotherapy, uh, wound care, and hemodialysis patients. Why do you think hemodialysis patients fit in the list? Yeah, think about it. They're going for dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's like they're coming coming in, being exposed to other people who may have been in the hospital recently. Same thing with the, the chemotherapy. They're usually going into infusion centers to get their chemo, and they're already immunosuppressed anyway. Uh, so, again, you can see how they can easily kind of spread uh, spread the love, so to speak, from, from one another, right? So, again, these are all these patients that are risk they consider to be healthcare associated. So... Um, there's also risk factors we'll talk about. Some, some of these are modifiable, some of these are unmodifiable, or things we can't really change, right? So you can't change a patient's age. They're old, they're old, can't do much about it. Um, they have chronic lung disease, depressed consciousness, unless you know we gave, made them have depressed consciousness with like drugs or something. Um, large volume aspiration, like they threw up uh, and aspirated uh, contents. Um, they're hospitalized during the winter months. Those are all considered unmodifiable. Modifiable ones are things that we try to focus on when they're in the hospital. So things like getting them off the ventilator. The sooner you can extubate a patient, the better it is for them, typically. Um, get rid of NG tubes. Um, what do you think an ICP monitor is? It's intracranial pressure. It's not anything to do with the insane clown posse, as some people might incorrectly assume. But yes, intracranial pressure. So if you had a patient, uh, say it's a surgical ICU that came for head trauma, they're having uh, increased intracranial pressure, you can put a monitor in there. Again, very easy vector for uh, bacteria to, to get in there. This uh, next one's interesting. So we mentioned antihistamines, right? So we talked about there's two main types of histamine receptors. What do H1 receptors do? Think mm, beta. So I'm used for what type of purpose? H1 blockers. So H1 are for allergy, right? So think H1, think histamine from like causing allergy, think anaphylaxis. We'll talk about anaphylaxis later, but um, you use that a lot for like seasonal allergies, seasonal rhinitis, things like that. H2 blockers are going to be more focused on GI effects, right? Because H2 receptors are found within the, uh, the parietal cells. They stimulate gastric acid secretion. So typically, does anyone know what the pH of the stomach normally is? Two, right? So if I give a drug, and this can include things like proton pump inhibitors, which we'll talk about in the GI section, H2 blockers, antacids, that is going to do what to the pH? Raise it up, right? So I increase that. Um, what does that do to bacterial growth? Makes it much more hospitable, right? So now all of a sudden you're increasing uh, the, the pH. Bacteria can grow much more easily. It makes it much more easy for them to kind of aspirate. Because, uh, again, you're always having these kind of little micro aspirations you're worried about. Um, they can get, very easily get this bacteria down into the respiratory tract and cause disease. The problem here we run into with these ICU patients especially is that when you're in the ICU and you're really kind of critically ill, um, what does your cortisol levels look like? They're typically pretty super high, right? And again, what is um, what does all that stress do to say like that a protective barrier in the stomach? Goes away. That's why I always hear about people having like ulcers uh, when they're really chronically stressed all the time, like they have a really stressful job or something. Um, that's what I was probably heading towards before I left that job and now I'm teaching. Like you know, I'm like way happier. But um, because of that, by having those kind of really high physically stressed kind of states, like you're more likely to have uh, erosion of that gastric um, uh, barrier, more likely to see ulcers develop there. So we want to prevent that, right, by giving things like that will, that will increase the pH of the stomach by uh, decreasing gastric acid production. But then now we've got to worry about the, the pneumonia aspects of it, right? So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, this is why, you know, it, it's really important to make sure that we do things like good oral hygiene for these patients. So if you ever um, see patients get, like, you know, these oral swabs, they're meant to kind of decontaminate the mouth to prevent some of the aspiration, things like that. So, again, just be aware that, you know, sometimes even though we're treating a patient for one thing to prevent an issue, it can possibly cause downstream issues as well, okay? Obviously, uh, previous antibiotic exposure, reintubation, all that can make them put them at risk, and we want to prevent that if possible uh, and, and, and kind of lower the risk for having these pneumonias.
So um, the bugs are going to be more common here. You're going to see a lot more of these gram-negative bacilli pop up, things like Pseudomonas. These tend to be the most common. E. coli, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, all these really bad gram-negative players here, right? And then the problem is that they tend to spread resistance amongst one another, these, these little plasmids, so that you may have a Pseudomonas that, you know, originally susceptible, but then it get, picks up, you know, resistance from the Klebsiella or things like that. Um, Gram positive wise, you still worry about things like strep pneumo, but now MRSA is going to be much more prominent. Again, we're going to want to cover for that. And then even you have to start considering, especially with immunosuppressed patients, things like fungal pathogens. Is it candida or aspergillus? You know, do they have thrush maybe prior to uh, coming in? And now that's spread down and now it's become more of a, a systemic disease, right? So all things you need to consider. So. How we're going to treat that? Obviously, you want to treat as soon as possible. Um, this is why it's one of those things, uh, one of the benchmarks that a lot of hospitals look at. You know, when you have a little old lady coming in from the nursing home with an ammonia. How quickly you get antibiotics on board is, is one of the kind of benchmarks because they we've seen decreased mortality the faster you get antibiotics on board because again that's going to save their life essentially. So uh, again, try to get the cultures first if you can. Get the antibiotics on board, and we're going to start off with broad spectrum antibiotics. We're going to be worried about those multi-drug resistant bacteria, so it means we're going to be covering for MRSA. And we're going to be covering for Pseudomonas. Basically, we're going to use one drug for the MRSA, and we're going to use two drugs to cover for Pseudomonas, because we're so worried about Pseudomonas, because it can be so deadly, we're going to use two drugs to cover for that. Okay, so basically, we're going to end up getting a three-drug regimen here. Once we get sensitivities back, then we can start to scale down therapy and much more uh, be tailored to what the actual bacterial, uh, the infection is. So, again, looking at these nosocomial pneumonias, kind of see how it uh, is broken down here. Essentially, looking at their risk factors, if they have any of these, then you're going to be more focusing on this broad spectrum therapy. And I'll tell you what these are in just a second. If not, they don't have any of these risk factors, then you can kind of go down and use more of kind of a limited spectrum. So if they haven't been in the hospital for very long, you know, if they haven't had any previous hospitalizations, any previous antibiotics, you know, they, you can use more limited spectrum. Versus if they have these risk factors, then you need to go with the really big guns. So limited spectrum empiric coverage. So if they lacked a lot of those um, those risk factors. And we're not worried about multi-drug resistant pathogens. We use ceftriaxone. This is one of our go-to uh, drugs here, right? So it's a third generation cephalosporin, really good gram negative coverage, decent gram positive coverage. So that's going to be our go-to. If you can't use that, then you can use a backup of something like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Again, um, if you're more worried about atypical pathogens, that's when you can start to consider using like your fluoroquinolone. Cephalosporins really won't cover those, but certainly the fluoroquinolones will. Um, or you could use something like ampicillin sulbactam. Because again, what's Sulbactam? Yeah, the drug itself is Unison. Yeah, it's a beta lactamase inhibitor, right? So it's expanding that coverage for ampicillin. So now we have a lot broader coverage with that. Or you could use something like Ertapenem. Ertapenem being one of the kind of, uh, kind of a wimpy carbapenem, very narrow spectrum. Um, uh, we don't use it too, too often. It's probably more often see either ceftriaxone or like levo, uh, levo, levofloxacin getting used most commonly in these cases. And again, all these are going to be IV therapy uh, for the most part for these type of type of sick patients. Now, if we need more broad spectrum coverage, this is where we're gonna use our three drug kind of cocktail here, right? So we're gonna be using uh, gram-negative combination therapy. So this is one of those rare cases where we actually use two drugs to cover their, for one bug. Um, we're gonna either use an anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin or an anti-pseudomonal carbapenem or an anti-pseudomonal penicillin. What do you kind of notice about these three drugs? What do you kind of notice about similar about their mechanism? They're all beta lactams. They're all cell wall active drugs, right? So you're going to use one drug that's going to be at least active against the cell wall. And then you're going to use plus either something like an anti pseudomonal uh, fluoroquinolone, typically like Levaquin or possibly Cipro, usually Levaquin more commonly, or an aminoglycoside, right? So you're going to use one of these plus one of these two. Usually what I end up seeing is a lot of. I will talk about the anti-pseudomonal um, options, um, but typically I see a lot of like gentamicin plus zosin, which is um, piperacillin, or I see, um, you know, levaquin plus uh, cefepime, right? So I see the kind of common combinations you're going to see come up when you get out there in practice. So those are two drugs you're going to use to cover for your pseudomonas and all your other gram negatives, and then you're going to have uh, either vancomycin or linazole for your gram positive coverage. Again, vancomycin is kind of our workhorse MRSA coverage. Most people can receive that. Uh, occasionally, you may not be able to, and linazole is a good backup. Okay.
So uh, as far as anti-pseudomonal cephalosporins, I'm really going to focus just on our uh, third and fourth generation. I'm not going to talk about ceftaroline and, and ceftolazine because we covered that in the antibacterial uh, section. Those are still super new and relatively expensive. Um, they're not going to be what you're going to jump to when you're in the actual ICU practicing, right? So ceftazidine, we don't use very commonly due to really rapid resistance. So our go-to is going to be cefepime. Remember the, the fourth generation cephalosporin. So cefepime is really good. If you're worried about pseudomonas, this is a good option to treat that. Okay. Remember, these require renal adjustment. If you think about a patient who is um, very, very, uh, very ill, um, you know, they start to get, uh, as they get more kind of systemic disease, what do you kind of call that due to... Sepsis, yeah, you're, so you're about sepsis, right? And so what happens to a patient's blood pressure when they're sepsis, uh, septic? Goes down, the hypotensive. Um, so in general, where does the body want to preferentially shuttle blood to when it's hypotensive? The heart and the brain, right? You can't really survive without those. I, can, I got two kidneys, right? I can get rid of those. I don't want to worry about those. I can get a machine for that. But the heart and the brain, you can't really replace those too easily, okay? So that means that the kidneys can take a take a hit there, right? Because you're going to start to vasoconstrict in different places to try to shuttle that blood back to the, the heart and the brain. So that means you can get hypoperfusion of the kidneys. And if you don't send enough oxygen via the blood to the kidneys, then they can have an injury, right? And so for all these renally adjusted drugs, you have to watch your renal function because it can have a tendency to go down over time. Especially if I give drugs that are going to increase blood pressure, you end up seeing more constriction there and even more... Uh, diminished blood flow. So it can be kind of a big issue there. So watch, watch, watch the renal function. If you don't adjust that, you can run into a lot of toxicity. Okay. Uh, as far as anti-pseudomonal carbapenems, typically we try to hold off on these if we can until we have uh, documented resistance, right? So if we can use all like a cefepime, that's great. Can utilize a penicillin, that's great as well. Try to hold off on your um, carbapenems. In a lot of cases, um, a lot of places are putting restrictions on these to where like, in, in, for instance, at Nemours, if you want to use meropenem, you have to have a, a approval by one of our infectious disease doctors. They have to call up and, you know, because it, it kind of puts us in a bad position in the pharmacy because doc's like, hey, I'm going to write for meropenem. And we say, did you get ID approval? They're like, well, why do I need their approval? I was like, well, because this is like a really big gun. We worry about resistance. We're going to hold off on this stuff. So we get yelled at. It's like, we just call ID. And then infectious disease will call back. And they're like, well, why don't you use this instead? That's what the pharmacist said. Well, why didn't you listen to them in the first place? You know, so anyway. Um, but it's one of those things where, again, we're trying to hold back. And again, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Like everyone's got to help out with this sort of thing to make sure we're using um, these antibiotics appropriately. So imipenem psilostat is one option. Do you guys remember any particular side effects with that? Seizure, yeah, with the renal dysfunction, right? So if the renal function takes a hit and they start to accumulate, seizures are a problem. Uh, you can see with that one. Meropenem is probably our, our go-to carbapenem in a lot of cases. This is the main one I see on formulary in most hospitals that I've been in. But you can see a little bit of difference there depending on where you're working at. And again, erdipenem has really limited uh, activity here. So we kind of use that more for those limited spectrum cases. This is not going to be a go-to for pseudomonal coverage here. Okay, and again, still require renal adjustment. And then as far as penicillins go, you're going to have piperacillin tazobactam as your kind of go-to. So everyone has probably heard of Zosin if you've ever been in a hospital. Um, again, it gets probably overprescribed in a lot of cases. And then there's also another one called ticaracillin, um, clavulonic acid, but I've never actually seen that in person. Um, but you may see it out there occasionally. Um, again, renal adjustment is also really important here as well. As far as anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolones, you see things like ciprofloxacin. Again, this depends on where you're working, what the kind of the, the document resistance is. And again, how would you check to see, like, if your hospital has a lot of resistant um, pseudomonas? Antibiogram, right? It's really important to look that up because maybe cipro is just something you never want to jump to in one hospital versus another. Say you go to work in somewhere like, uh, you know, Denver, Colorado, where the, the environment's completely different, maybe a great option, right? Um, Levaquin is usually pretty safe to go with uh, in a lot of cases. And again, these are good because they also have good activity against your uh, atypicals like mycoplasma, legionella, et cetera. Um, you'll also realize that a lot of drugs have a hard time kind of penetrating the lung tissue, but these have a, a very easy time doing that. So again, um, you don't have to use necessarily increased doses necessarily to get those high concentrations. Um, again, usually pretty ju judiciously remember the side effects we worry about. And again, renal adjustment is really important here as well. You guys remember what cardiac abnormality you could see with the fluoroquinolones? Torsades. Yeah, risk for torsades. More, more notably, what uh, can lead to that? Yeah. QT prolongation. Good. So you guys know all this stuff. You retained a lot of information. That's great. Yeah, I don't care what you made on the test. I care about it. you actually know the information. You can use it on a patient, right? That's what I care about. Anyway, um, aminoglycosides are also really good anti-pseudomonal drugs here as well. You have things like gentamicin, tobramycin, amikacin. Um, typically, uh, back in the day, you used to see these being used like every eight hours. Uh, but now we, we realize that you know, because uh, the concentration are, are time-dependent killers. Just remember? 
They're actually concentration dependent. That means we can get a really big dose all at once and allow the patient to clear it out for the rest of the day and then we can dose them again in the next. Because even if the levels are zero, they still have that post antibiotic effect, so killing off. Um, so we utilize, uh, and again, this used to cause a lot of nephrotoxicity, but because of the fact that we now use uh, large doses just one time a day, that kind of helps to, to clear out the, you know, the levels in the body and you see less nephrotoxicity. So that's one thing we do now. But again, we're using that therapy to drug monitoring for your immunoglycoside. It's really, really important. You're kind of prospectively evaluating the patient to make sure they're getting the right dose to begin with, and then you're following up on levels afterwards. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we have vancomycin. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for goal levels uh, for a lot of this stuff because, again, like your uh, aminoglycosides, typically you're looking for like undetectable levels, right? Because you just want to make sure the patient's clearing it and getting rid of it, so that way they're not accumulating, getting toxicity. On the other hand, though, with vancomycin, is this time or concentration dependent? This one's time dependent, right? You want to keep the levels above the MIC, and you can best measure that by measuring what? The PCR trough. Trough. So we're still measuring troughs here, but now we're doing it for a different reason, right? Because we're doing it to make sure we're uh, getting an efficacious level. And one of the things you'll see is that vancomycin is a very large molecule. It has a tough time penetrating tissues like the CNS or penetrating the lungs. And so for like, you know, a typical, you know, uh, skin infection, an abscess, I can give you, uh, I can get a level of like, 10 to 15, and I guess pretty good concentrations and kill off MRSA, no problem. For the lungs, though, I need to shoot for higher blood levels because the higher the blood level is, the more uh, I use that as a surrogate to say there's going to be higher tissue levels in the, in the lungs, and so I shoot for like 15 to 20. So just be aware, there's some differences there. I'm not going to ask you on the level specifically, but just can't, can't keep those clinical um, kind of uh, considerations in mind, right? Your, your dose may change depending on what the, the indication is. And remember, why do we check before the third or the fourth dose? want to make sure it's steady state, absolutely. Again, absolutely requires renal adjustment. This is the other big one we do a lot of um, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring on. It's aminoglycosides and vancomycin. And again, that makes sense because these are, uh, you know, with your, a lot of your ICU patients who are coming in for different uh, conditions, especially pneumonias, uh, especially sepsis and things like that. You're worried about MRSA. You're worried about pseudomonas. So these two drugs get used all the time. And then uh, Zyvox or linazolid, great MRSA coverage, but again, very expensive like to hold off on it. No renal adjustment, which is nice. It's also got a PO version you can convert patients over to. But again, hold off on it. You know, we like to save that for when you have like vancomycin resistant staph aureus. That's the, the big thing we like to save it for. Okay. So typically, once you get your culture results back, then we're going to scale down therapy as appropriate. You always want to switch over to PO whenever you can. Why do you think that is? Cheaper, right? So I put that on the slide. What's another good reason? They could possibly go home, absolutely. That's, that's another good reason. You can get rid of IV lines. You can get rid of a source for infection, right? That can be another thing. So you want to get rid of all the hardware as soon as you can in a lot of cases. Now, if you have failure therapy, say you're giving your patient antibiotics, it's a really broad spectrum of stuff, and they're just not getting any better, what are some possible reasons for that? What do you guys think? You had the wrong bug. Yeah, so that's possibly a resistant bug. That's one thing. What else? Well, what's another reason why we have um, failure? Yeah, so we have resistant bugs. We got the wrong bug we were hoping for. What if it's not even a bacteria? What if it's a fungus, right? What if it's a virus, right? Like, what are the, you know, what these things we need to consider? Um, you know, the, a lot of times, you know, what about tuberculosis? Like, what about mycoplasma? Um, some of these things take a long time to culture for. So, like, we'll have cases where, you know, we start off on broad spectrum antibiotics, like I say, an HIV patient. Um, you know, they're not getting any better. Then we send off for uh, tuberculosis uh, testing, and again, it can take a few weeks or so, and you're just kind of waiting and hoping the patient's going to improve for you. But um, sometimes you have the wrong diagnosis. Sometimes it could be uh, pulmonary embolism that can be masquerading, sort of like a pneumonia or neoplasm or something like that. And then certainly, like, you know, empyemas, lung abscesses, those can also be very difficult to treat as well. And then, obviously, when you're giving these broad-spectrum antibiotics, what happens to the gut flora? Yeah, it's gone, right? Um, and so then you have to worry about C. diff popping up as well. So it's kind of as an opportunistic infection. Typically, seven to eight days of therapy is pretty good for most of these cases. You may need to treat for longer, especially if it's one of these really nasty kind of gram negatives like Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, um, Burkholdia, Stenotrophomonas. All these uh, tend to require a little bit longer therapy. So just realize there's a little bit of di difference there. I probably won't ask you on a test specifically how many days to treat for. Just know that, you know, for your more kind of virulent bugs, treat for a little bit longer. Because, again, you're always going to go back to your, your guidelines. You're going to go back to your references to see your Sanford guides and things like that. How long should I be treating for? Okay. I will give you guys a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then rock the rest of this out. All right. Uh, any questions from the first half? Okay. A few points of clarifications. One, I apologize if I was misinterpreted. Um, if there was a miscommunication and you thought you did not need to know mechanisms for anything, 
That is incorrect. You do need to know mechanisms. My point, and again, I would have to listen to the tape to see what I said, but that's the benefit of me taping everything is that you guys can call me out when I say something stupid, right? So I'll eat crow if, I, if it was misinterpreted. But uh, the point being is when I said, you know, a patient's not going to ask you what the mechanism is, but it's important that you know still what it is, at least to some degree, right? You don't need to know it in the same detail that maybe a pharmacist would need to know it, right? But you should at least be aware of things like, you know, just like with the, the pneumonia, right? Why do we choose penicillin plus an aminoglycoside? Why don't I use a penicillin plus a cephalosporin? Well, I know that those mechanisms are too similar, then I'm not going to get any additional benefit from a bacterial kill standpoint. So I'm going to use different mechanisms, right? That makes sense when you look at interactions as far as, you know, why do antifungals cause so many SIP interactions? Well, because it affects fungal SIP enzymes. You know, those are things I want you to kind of key in on. And so still be aware of those mechanisms. Um, be aware of that when we're kind of, you know, because the, the tests are not cumulative. But if the antibiotics keep showing up on these different sections, like it's important you at least be aware of that, right? So we kind of go back and I ask you, know, well, you know, we cover, uh, uh, you know, statins that treat hyperlipidemia. What's a major drug interaction? Well, sip. 3A4 inhibitors, right? We know that the macrolides do that. So those are little things we're going to keep going back on. We talk about antiarrhythmics. Guess what? There's a lot of drugs that affect QTC. These drugs are also going to interact with that as well. So again, kind of keep going back and refreshing yourself because uh, the biggest thing I hear from students on rotations, the number one problem they have is what? Antibiotics, right? That's the biggest thing because, again, you just have to see it a million times before you become really comfortable with it. And so the more you can see it now, the better off you're going to be on, on rotations, right? Anyway, uh, the other point is, a uh, question comes up, you know, I say glucocorticoids, I say corticosteroids, what's the difference? Does anyone know? Okay, corticosteroids is the overarching sort of category for these steroids, right? So, like, the normal cortisol that you release is a corticosteroid, right? Now, you can break that down into two categories. There's glucocorticoids and there's mineralocorticoids, okay? Does anyone know what mineralocorticoids do? They're much more responsible for maintaining fluid uh, status in a patient, right? So you think about hydrocortisone is a really good one that has good mineralocorticoid effects. They primarily focus on retaining fluid in the body. So they do things like um, cause decreased uh, uh, urination or decreased elimination of fluid through the kidneys, right? You're going to hold on to more fluids. Uh, this is why if you have someone who has, say, adrenal insufficiency, say I was giving them a bunch of steroids, say, for, for anaphylaxis, as we're going to see here, uh, and then I discontinued all of a sudden. They were on it for three weeks, and I discontinued without tapering. They can run into this adrenal insufficiency where one of the big problems they get is hypotension because they can't – basically, their their uh, the vasculature is just, you know, third space in these fluids. They can't hold on to it appropriately. So those are mineralic corticoid effects, right? So those are all about fluids. And, again, you notice that all corticosteroids Steroids, they have a little bit of, of glucocorticoid and mineralic corticoid effects, which is why one of the side effects of when I give prednisone is what? Weight gain. Weight gain caused by? More fluids. More fluids and? Edema, right? So you can see edema. So you think about your CHF patients, right? We'll talk more about that later. But that makes sense. You know, think about it. Um, someone goes on birth control for the first time. What can you, what's a possible side effect? weight gain, right? Because again, these are all steroids. There's a little bit of bleed over here and they can still have a little bit of those mineralic corticoid effects. You know, right? So between the estrogen and the progestin. So again, this all makes sense when you go back to the mechanism. See? Okay. I'm trying to make links here. Anywho, so that's the mineralic corticoid effects. On the flip side of that, you have the glucocorticoids. When we're looking at anti-inflammatories, we talk about anaphylaxis, we talk about asthma, different things like that. We're mainly focused on the glucocorticoid effects, right? You think glucose, you think glucose, you think fight or flight response. I need lots of glucose to run away from that bear that's over there. Um, those are, that all kind of makes sense, right? So those, again, those are stress hormones. Um, you know, that makes sense with the mineral corticoids. If I'm in a stress state, I probably want my blood pressure up as well so I can pump oxygen to where I need it. Um, but think about glucocorticoids as being anti-inflammatory. They're going to raise my glucose. Uh, that's where you can see intraocular pressure increases. You can see all these other kind of side effects um, that you see from these steroids. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So the mineral corticosteroids are the ones that maintain fluids? Or That's fluids? primarily what we're going to see there, right? And they can affect things like potassium, sodium, um, retention, things like that. Okay. So the glucocorticoids the one that stop you from sleeping? Stop. Keep you hyper? Or Typically, yeah. So a lot of the drugs that when we give, like glucocorticoids, like prednisone and things like that, you can see things like, you know, changes in mental status and, and insomnia and things like okay. that, for sure. Yeah. Primarily, that's all we've talked about. But again, there's a little bit of bleed over. So again, you can see um, like prednisone can have a little bit of mineralic corticoid effects. I mentioned hydrocortisone. We talked about you know, acne, or I'm sorry, not uh, acne specifically, but like dermatitis, right? We talked about hydrocortisone. If you were to give that intravenously, um, again, it's very similar to the cortisol we have that our body produces. Those have it has good mineralic corticoid effects. So like I've had a patient, um, do you guys are familiar with the, the hypothalamic pituitary axis? 
hypothalamus in the brain, right, communicates down to the pituitary gland, and that communicates out to a lot of the endocrine organs, like your uh, thyroid gland, communicates to um, lots of different things, right? So we had, like, one patient who has uh, unfortunately had a tumor and had to have their pituitary gland resected, okay? Um, you see this a lot, especially when I did, uh, I did some volunteering at the School for the Deaf and Blind over in St. Augustine when I was in school. A lot of those kids all had tumors, and that's how they became blind, is actually due to um, I trying to actually cut those back. It's very, very sad. Um, but the problem is a lot of their endocrine stuff was screwed up, right? One of the problems they run into is because they cannot control their cortisol very well, they have this hypotension that can develop there. And so, like, we had this one patient, she comes in the ER all the time because she gets really stressed like something happens because she's a teenager she something happens in her life she gets stressed out she can't respond by producing enough cortisol unless she gets hypotensive and then she gets ultimate status has to come into the er we give her hydrocortisone give her fluids she perks right back up and then she's she's good to go right so again all these can think about these things think about the pathogenesis think about how the medications are working along with that to try to fix the problems that we're seeing there okay Sometimes it's not just the baseline problem. She doesn't produce the mineralic corticoids. It's sometimes higher than that. It's not sometimes higher in the CNS where the, the kind of, you know, on the top of the pyramid, essentially the problems that affect everything downstream of that. Make sense? Okay. If everyone's still with me. Anyway, um, okay, so let's continue to talk about uh, kind of more respiratory issues. Again, I mentioned anaphylaxis here because I didn't really have a good spot to put this elsewhere. Um, but again, one of the primary complications of anaphylaxis is what? compromised airway, right? So you're going to see a lot of swelling here. And again, this is a, a severe systemic allergic reaction. Have you guys covered anaphylaxis at all yet? Okay, good. So get a good overview here. Again, this is a multi-system involvement, right? The whole body gets involved here, but typically what you're going to see is a lot of skin manifestations, see a lot of airway uh, issues, vascular system involvement, and then GI effects as well. And again, one of the big problems you run into is either the cardiovascular compromise. Um, typically, what do you see, uh, if you think about someone who is um, you know, they have an allergic reaction, say like peanuts or, or shellfish or whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, they release a ton of histamine. What do you think that does to the, the vasculature? Is it vasodilate or vasoconstrict? Dilates, right? Just go like when you get a wheel and flare reaction, uh, you know, the contact dermatitis. So you get that edema that happens there because the vessels are opening up essentially. That happens on a global scale. Basically, it's very hypotensive. And what do you think the cardiac response is to that? It's going to pump faster. I see a very tachycardic. They get very hypotensive. You can see arrhythmias. You can see cardiovascular collapse. They can start to code from that aspect. The other side of it is on the respiratory side where their airway is going to start to become more edematous. It's going to start to close off. Uh, and then you can worry about having obstruction. That's where, you know, you worry about things like um, uh, intubation, uh, you know, doing cricothyrotomy and things like that. Um, try to in maintain an airway, a patent airway for those patients, right? So it's a very, very dangerous thing. You want to make sure you, you treat it uh, appropriately and early if you can. All right, so lots of things can cause this, you know, anywhere from, from animals to uh, medications, everything in between. Keep in mind, this is kind of a spectrum, right? You can have patients presenting for very kind of minor allergic reactions where some of these meds will be appropriate all the way up to the full-on anaphylactic shock, hypotensive, they're coming in via EMS, they're, they're coding, um, right? So it's kind of a spectrum here, and you kind of have to gauge that when you're deciding what kind of drugs to use, essentially. So obviously signs and symptoms, severe uh, airway edema. Again, you can notice uh, you hear striders. And what does that term strider mean? It's kind of, yeah, it's inspiratory wheeze. It sounds like kind of like a whistling sound. It's never a good sign, right? You never want to hear strider. Um, certainly their, their lung exam, they're going to uh, also do that kind of that, uh, that uh, histamine reaction. You're going to be seeing uh, a lot of bronchosecretions kind of forming up. So they're going to have a lot of mucus showing up there and bronchoconstriction. So again, it's going to be impeding airflow. Uh, those are the big things we worry about kind of initially, kind of the most immediately life-threatening issues. Um, the cardiovascular manifestations, as we mentioned, tachycardia, hypotension. And then again, the histamine doesn't really know if it's hitting H1 receptor or H2 receptor, so there's GI effects as well. And we'll cover that more in the GI section later on, but the H2 effects are going to increase things like gastric acid production. It's going to lead to a lot of nausea, vomiting, you know, um, uh, GERD, things like that. So just some pictures of what anaphylaxis might look like. Again, usually a lot of uh, swelling of the eyes, of the face, you know, and again, the whole airway is becoming more edematous and potentially closing off. So the first thing we do, have I covered fluid stuff at all with you guys yet? We, do we cover like a PED section of pharmacodynamics, or the 4-2-1 rule? Oh, yeah, we did cover that, didn't we? Yes, it rears its ugly head again. Um, okay. First thing you got to do for these patients, or one of the first thing, one of the easiest things to do is going to be volume expansion for these patients. When I say volume expansion, what does that mean? Yeah. 
I want to tank up the intravascular space. I want to give them fluids, right? I want to make sure that they have low blood pressure. I want to try to give them as much, uh, basically try to fill up that garden hose as much as possible, right? So I may not be able to help them squeeze down necessarily, at least not with the fluids. We'll talk about a drug that does that in a second. But fill up that intravascular space. It's going to help out with the blood pressure, hopefully bring the heart rate down a little bit. And we typically use what we call IV crystalloids. When I say crystalloids, does anyone know what that means? Salt-based, essentially, right? So sodium chloride is the most common one. There's also colloids. Um, those are typically things like albumin. They're protein-based, typically, right? But we talk about crystalloids. This is the most common one. They're cheap. They're safe. They're effective. So um, we use 0.9% sodium chloride. Does anyone know why you use 0.9%? Why not 1% or 0.5%? Um, mm -hmm. It's isotonic to what's in the body, right? So it has the same osmolality, essentially, as the blood, right? It's around uh, 308. Uh, uh, osmolality versus ours is like 280 to 320-ish, you know, somewhere around there. So anyway, so these are good numbers to remember, and I will ask you this on a test. Uh, so be able to do very simple math, okay? Very simple, no calculators needed, I can guarantee you. Um, so a good fluid bolus, and when I say bolus, what does that mean? Big dose, kind of all given at once, right? You give us over a few minutes, you give it a half an hour. Basically, we're going to use 20 mLs per kilo. This is a good number to remember for any patient. You can't really go wrong with this number. Um, this is good for pediatrics. You can use it on a one kilogram premature neonate. You can use it on a hundred kilogram uh, adult male. Doesn't really matter. Typically, you're gonna do 20 mLs per kilo, and you'll use up to a max of one to two liters. Okay. If you start to, you know, if you have like a, you know, 400 pound dude you're treating, and you know, you're like, okay, calculate, you know, so many uh, liters. You know, just do one to two. You can always give more, but once I put it into the patient, can I take it back? Not easy, right? So uh, I can't take it back. So I need to be you know, kind of careful with that. You know, sometimes we use less than 20 mLs per kilo. If I have a renal patient or they're already really edematous to begin with, I might start less than that. But just remember 20 mLs per kilo for most patients, okay? So then you may find that some of these patients are so hypotensive, you end up having to give repeat doses. And it's not uncommon to get four to eight liters of normal saline to fill this patient back up, right? Because their intravascular space is so dilated and so leaky, uh, they're just you know losing fluids into the interstitial space at, at an alarming rate. So after that, though, you typically want to put them on what we call maintenance fluids, right? This is a lower rate, but it's something you can leave them on for a long time to kind of help um, replace any losses that they're having in a, in a general sense, either due to urine or these insensible losses like the respiratory tract, things like that. And so we use that 4 one rule. So remember, for the first 10 kilograms of the patient, they get 4 mLs per kilo per minute, second, hour. Per hour, right? So this is, we're calculating an hourly fluid rate. So 4 mLs per kilo for the first 10 kilograms. So it means if I had a 10 kilo child, they would end up getting what maintenance fluid rate? 4 times 10, 40 mLs per kilo, or 40 mLs per hour, right? 40 mLs per hour. Uh, for the next 10 kilos, they're going to get 2 mLs per kilo. So that, say, a 20 kilogram patient, their fluid rate would be? So 40 for the first 10, and then 20 for the next 10. So you get 60 mLs per hour, okay? Practice with this. Do, do, you know, can you kind of make up your own cases. And again, this is one of those things where you see it enough, you can just do it in your head, no problem, right? So you can just look at a, a patient's weight and figure out what their fluid, their maintenance rate is, no, no problem. Uh, and then for every subsequent mL, or every subsequent kilogram, you do one mL per kilo, okay? So for instance, if you had a 60 kilogram patient, they get 40 mLs per hour for the first 10 kilos, they get 20 mLs per hour for the second 10 kilos, and they get one mL per kilo per hour for every kilogram after that. So for a patient who's 60 kilograms, you got rid of the first 20 kilograms, now you have 40 left over. That's just 40 mLs per hour. You add that together, boom, they get 100 mLs per hour. Okay? Again, you can't really go wrong with the, these calculations. You can use it for adult patients. You can use it for, because again, typically when you're dealing with adults, they say, just put them on a, just put them on a maintenance fluid rate. And you're like, well, what maintenance fluid rate is that? Use this number, you can't go wrong. Right? Use this formula. That make sense? So you can go back and review your PEDS notes from Pharmacodynamics if you need to, but this is going to come up. Okay, so I get them fluids to try to tank them back up. And again, a lot of these things are kind of happening at the same time. So think about like, you know, the ER type of setting. Um, you may have a nurse setting up IV lines to get the, the fluid started. Um, we also have uh, epinephrine that can help us out, right? So again, epinephrine, everyone makes this themselves, right? It's primarily comes from the adrenal glands as well as, you know, cortisol and things like that. But it's an endogenous catecholamine. So it's very similar like norepinephrine, dopamine, structurally very similar. But it's going to be acting on both alpha and beta receptors. Okay, so why is that important for us? So if it acts on alpha receptors, particularly alpha-1, what does that do for, uh, say, for instance, our blood pressure? It's going to raise it, right, because we have a lot of alpha-1 receptors in the vasculature. So by activating alpha-1, because vasoconstriction, 
That fixes one of the main problems we already see there, right? Because we have a lot of hypotension due to this anaphylaxis. We give epinephrine, it's going to help to fix that, right? Um, we also have beta receptors, right? So primarily we have what types of beta receptors? Beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 is primarily found where? The heart. That's a cardiac, yeah, it's a cardiac one. So beta 1 is primarily found in the heart. Certainly that can increase heart rate. It's not really what we're so concerned about at that point, but the big thing is the beta 2 effects. Beta 2, where do we see those primarily? On the lungs, right? So on the lungs, we have beta 2 activation. Then what does that do for us? Bronchodilator, right? So we're going to be a bronchodilator by giving beta 2 activation, right? So in one area, on the vasculature, it's alpha 1 activation squeezes. On the lungs, it's going to uh, bronchodilate, right? So again, keep in mind those kind of uh, different effects. Uh, depending on what type of smooth muscle is activating, based on the receptors, the actions are, are different, okay? And again, um, how is this epinephrine normally given? Do you guys know? In the hip or something? Yeah, usually intramuscularly, right? So you think about EpiPens, right? Everyone's heard of an EpiPen, I'm sure. And again, that's one of the big things they always tell someone who's had a previous anaphylactic allergy, always carry your EpiPen on you, right? Because again, you never know when peanuts can strike, sneak <laughs> up on you anytime. But again, you always want to have like an EpiPen available because this is life-threatening, right? They can they can certainly die from this if they don't get prompt medical care. So always, always, always educate them to have their, their EpiPen on them. So the big thing, vasoconstrictor, it's going to help to relax that bronchial smooth muscle. It's going to help us, the patient breathe better and help their blood pressure, okay? Also helps with, uh, you know, the pruritus, urticaria, angioedema, all that good stuff gets affected as well. So um, typically given IM, not really given sub-Q too, too often. Uh, IM is more common we're going to see nowadays or potentially given IV. That's really if the patient's like coding and they're kind of like clinically dead. Um, we don't want them to get to that point, so hopefully we can give an IM beforehand. So concentrations, uh, this is something I'm uh, probably going to start phasing out of this, this lecture because this we're actually moving away from this. So um, it used to be expressed, epinephrine was expressed in this concentration of 1 to 10,000, 1 to 1,000. Uh, does anyone know what that means? Basically it means it's 1 gram per 1,000 mLs, or 1 to 10,000 is 1 gram per 10,000 mLs. Not super useful clinically, right? We'd rather know like how many milligrams per mL the concentration is, because again, when you're thinking about like I want to give this medication to this patient IV, um, knowing the dose is good, but you also want to know the volume you're actually going to administer, because that's what the nurse wants to know. She wants to know how, how much volume she actually needs to push through the IV line to get to the patient, and so you need to figure that out. Basically, there's a couple different concentrations that are available, and they're moving away from this because, as you might imagine, there's a lot of screw ups, right? People screw this up all the time. They either give a tenfold overdose or tenfold underdose, depending on how they're administering, right? So overdose is really bad because you can see, um, you know, cerebral vascular accidents can occur. You can cause the, the cerebral vessels to vasoconstrict too much and cause stroke. Uh, you can see MI being precipitated, you see all kinds of problems. And then obviously even too little could cause what problem? There's, they you didn't fix the anaphylaxis, right? They're still hypotensive. They're going to cardiovascular collapse, or they're they're still uh, they're they're not having any kind of bronchodilation, anything like that. So obviously there are big problems either way, and so um, we're getting away from this now. They're being more explicit, saying that hey, we're using um, uh, you know this this concentration, this many milligrams per ml, either one or, or 0.1. Um, so which one do you think you'd use for intramuscular administration? Do you think you'd use more concentrated or less concentrated? Why why more concentrated? So it's a smaller volume because it's more concentrated, right? And we know that injecting uh, stuff into the muscles uh, can be very painful, right? So you don't want to, uh, you know, if you think about a tenfold difference here in the concentrations, uh, most of these EpiPens come as a 0.3 milligram. This is like the adult dose, essentially. So imagine um, injecting basically a volume of 0.3 mLs, not very much, versus 3 mLs into the muscle. Big difference there, right? It's a lot harder for them to actually, you know, actually push down three miles. These things, the auto injectors, are really cool because basically they're just designed to, um, once the, the edge of them gets pushed into the thigh, it just auto injects the stuff right through the the clothing and all that. Um, so again, you want small volumes here, so use more concentrated dose. Anyway, um, as you might imagine, uh, this is going to mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So it's kind of like kicking your fight or flight response into, into overdrive when you administer this. So they're not going to feel very good. They're going to be anxious, uh, hypertensive, tachycardic, if not vomiting, diaphoresis. They're basically just kind of overloading their, their sympathetic nervous system. So they won't feel good. They'll be alive, which is a good trade-off, I think. Um, but just be aware of that and be careful of these overdoses. They can, be, they can be fatal in their own right. Okay, uh, so we have epinephrine, we have our, our, our uh, fluids we're going to be giving our patients. Now we want to focus also on, on histamine, right? Because, again, that's one of the major um, kind of uh, propagators of the, this inflammatory reaction is we want to give histamine blockers. We're going to be focusing primarily on H1 because, again, this is one that's related back to allergy. Uh, we're also going to focus a little bit on H2. So you, sometimes you'll see, and again, we're going to focus more on these H2 blockers in the, in the GI section.
So um, you, you may see things like Zantac or Ranitidine being given, but the primary thing I want to focus on here for our purposes are going to be things like diphenhydramine. Would anyone know the brand name for that? Yeah, Benadryl. I uh, also have things like hydroxazine or Atarax. Um, those typically can be given either PO or IV. And again, depending on the spectrum of your patient, if they're coming in and they're already selling their, their airways going, IV is going to be the way to go versus they, you know, just having some, some hives and, and urticaria, you can probably get away with PO, you know, to, so evaluate your patient, decide what's best for them. Um, so we get these H1 blockers, and again, this is going to be good because it affects the histamine that's already been released from all these degranulated mast cells, right? Some other things we can give. We can also give bronchodilators, so especially if you don't have IV access or uh, you've not had a chance for the epinephrine to really kick in yet. We can also use bronchodilators like albuterol. We'll talk much more about this in detail in the asthma section coming up. Um, but basically, albuterol is uh, our go-to beta-2 agonist, and again, primarily affecting that bronchoconstriction by reversing that. Right? So we have bronchodilator. Um, as you might imagine, adverse effects. Uh, very, I don't know if anyone's ever received um, albuterol via a nebulizer before, but uh, I have a distinct memory of this because I grew up as a nerdy fat kid, um, and I had really bad asthma. And whenever I had like a bad cold or something like that, my inhaler just wouldn't kick in. I just wasn't working good enough. So I had to have this like big giant uh, nebulizer my brother and sister made fun of me for. But anyway, basically, you know, nebulizer, anyone ever uh, seen or worked with one besides our respiratory therapist? Um, basically, it's, uh, you could probably explain it way better than I could. But essentially, you take this little tiny cup, you put the drug, it's in liquid form into it, and it uh, basically vibrates at a very high frequency, and it aerosolizes the, the drug essentially, right? So the dose you get is really big because you're uh, basically uh, kind of going for this kind of shotgun approach where you're just letting the patient kind of breathe it in passively and you're just having a lot of drugs just kind of off gassing regardless of the dose you get is way huge uh, a lot bigger than you would actually get if you were just using a very kind of um uh, you know single spray uh, from the you know the multi-dose inhaler or meter dose inhaler i should say so the adverse effects you can see are a lot of anxiousness because again you're still having that kind of sympathetic effect you get a lot of tremor associated with it and tachycardia so it doesn't really make sense though because we said beta 2 effects you know primarily in the lungs but why would you see tachycardia on the heart because those are beta 1 receptors So remember, selectiv drug selectivity is relatively relative, right? So again, if you give a big enough dose of a drug, it loses that selectivity. And so you can see some bleed over effect and it can affect beta one as well, right? So I remember every time I'd have to use the, this nebulizer because I was getting such a huge dose of it, I was super tremulous, I was uh, very anxious, and then I would have you know, this kind of this racing heart going, right? So uh, you know, it doesn't feel super comfortable, but again, if they can breathe, that's kind of the trade-off. It, it's kind of worth it. Anyway, uh, the next thing we're gonna use is also gonna be corticosteroids. Now, what we've seen so far is we've seen drugs that work directly on these receptors, either blocking histamine or activating alpha receptors or beta-2 receptors. How quick do you think those work? Pretty quick, not quick at all? Pretty quick, right? Because they're affecting directly the receptors, right? So, um, you know, the histamine's been released. We're directly blocking those receptors. Corticosteroids, and these are primarily glucocorticoids, to be clear, um, are going to be working a little bit slower. They're more powerful anti-inflammatories drugs because they're working kind of at the top of the pyramid, right? They're working on the very beginning aspect of affecting gene transcription of a lot of these inflammatory proteins. So they're working very high up, but they take time to work, usually several hours to kick in. You still give them early on, but these are not going to be the thing that save the patient's life immediately. The epi is really the big thing. It's going to be the lifesaver if they're having a really severe allergic reaction, okay? So this works on all aspects, but it takes time to work. Uh, and typically, we use a lot of things like methylprednisolone, uh, usually IM or IV. That's kind of a, a really good one. And again, it's to be structurally related to prednisone, which would be a kind of a good oral option, okay? Again, we talked about the side effects already of these, uh, you know, hyperglycemia, you can see altered mental status, insomnia, all kinds of different things. But uh, again, these are usually going to be given for uh, uh, usually what we call kind of burst therapy, where you give it for, say, like five days, and that gives the patient time to kind of deal with that inflammation and kind of get over whatever the inciting event was, whether it be, you know, peanut or uh, shellfish, whatever it happens to be, uh, they kind of get over that hump, and then uh, the uh, you know, then you can kind of get off the steroids and they should be back to normal essentially. Okay, so pulse dose therapy, usually five days or so. All right, so any questions about anaphylaxis? So again, if I were to ask you like, okay, what, you know, what meds would you use for a patient? Which ones are the slowest or the quickest? Um, you know, how much fluid should someone get? You guys can answer all those questions now. We just want to review the stuff and can answer on a test, right? All right. Okay, so bleeding into that uh, is going to be asthma. So obviously this is still an allergic kind of condition we're going to be dealing with. Um, again, the big deal here is this is reversible, right? If it's irreversible, this is where we're going to run into things like COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, things like that. But this is reversible airway uh, or narrowing of these bronchial airways. So this is a really important thing here. 
patients are going to have a lot of increased bronchial responsiveness. Typically, are complaining of chest tightness, shortness of breath, wheezing, all that good stuff. Um, typically, have uh, kind of increased, you know, uh, mucus production, bronchial uh, uh, or constriction, all that good stuff. Really kind of impeding good airway flow. It's really responsible for a ton of visits, especially as we get into the winter time months. So a lot of like, you know, respiratory viruses going about. Um, just the change in weather can be enough to trigger some patients, uh, patients' asthma. You see a ton, a, a big spike in the ER visits, especially, um, especially with, um, uh, you know, in dealing with pediatrics. A ton of kids, you know, kind of getting sent home from school. Patient, you know, especially when the parents come home from work, take their kids to the ER to get the, uh, checked up for all these asthma attacks are happening here. Um, so I'm not going to focus super in-depth on the path here necessarily but again you guys have you guys covered asthma so far good so you guys are kind of familiar with the kind of the basic drugs to use to treat okay good so be good review for you guys anywho so again uh the big thing we want to deal with is this inflammation certainly we can deal with kind of the direct airway obstruction and, and hyper responsiveness due to that constriction of the bronchial uh, smooth muscle um but again we're also going to be working on the inflammation so we're kind of we'll see as well that there's kind of two main forms of therapy here there's going to be maintenance therapy which prevents an asthma exacerbation from occurring and there's also going to be rescue therapy rescue which one do you think works faster Absolutely rescue there because we're rescuing the patient from dying, right? Um, so again, rescue therapy is going to be the, kind of the quick stuff. It's important to make sure that patients have been taken care of from both the rescue side and the maintenance side, depending on kind of the characteristics of their disease, right? So some people only have, you know, exercise-induced asthma. Do they need to be on long-term maintenance therapy? No, they know exactly when they're going to have an asthma exacerbation, so they can use something quick right beforehand, right, to prevent that from occurring. As opposed to someone who has kind of like long-term, uh, you know, kind of more chronic asthma, that's the person who's going to need more kind of maintenance therapy. So, like for instance, my asthma is nowadays really only triggered by a lot of like animal dander and things like that. So I know that if I'm going to go up to my you know cousin's house to go hang out with him, uh, he has a bunch of dogs. I have to make sure I take you know my controller medication for a few days beforehand and really let it start to kick in. And before I go visit them, right? Otherwise, I'm going to use my inhaler like every five minutes. That's no good. So um, we'll talk about the different drugs and how they can kind of fit in those different categories. Um, and again, every patient is going to be a little bit different. So that's why history is super important. Okay. And obviously, you know, we're going to be focusing on, uh, you know, the, a lot of these, uh, these inflammatory cells, these mast cells that are degranulating as soon as they get exposed to things like IgE and these allergens here. Um, but basically, the big thing we're going to be focusing on are prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and then histamine as well. But certainly other uh, inflammatory mediators are going to be important here as well. Uh, but those are going to be the primary things we're going to be looking at when we look at our drug therapy. I got a hiccup here again. No technical difficulties. It only happens with you guys. Like every other class I teach, like I have no issues with the PowerPoint. But one time a week with you guys, this happens. Is it a coincidence or is there a correlation here? I don't think it's a PowerPoint. So it seems goofy. I don't want to lose all that progress. Amen. You guys ever see Coffee Talk on Saturday Night Live from years ago? Mike Myers? He's like, talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir was neither Mormon nor a choir. Okay, all right, so back on track. Um, the big thing to note here is the fact that asthma itself, you guys kind of heard of this biphasic kind of peak in, in allergic response. So when you have an asthma exacerbation, certainly have the kind of the early reactions happening here. And a lot of this is due to these kind of immediate kind of degranulation of these mast cells, releasing things like histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, all kind of leading to that initial kind of smooth muscle uh, uh, constriction. Which you typically find kind of in the, the longer term, over the course of several hours, you end up getting this kind of late reaction. And what you typically find is that someone who only has maybe rescue therapy that works on this immediate phase, you kind of find that they uh, can be uh, a little bit more susceptible to these late phase reactions. And when people die from asthma, typically it's due to these late reactions, right? And so it's this kind of more kind of uh, long term kind of uh, constriction you can see that lasts for hours. This is why it's so important that we treat these patients. We don't just deal with this early reaction. We give them early, quick-acting medications. We also want to focus on things that are going to be able to deal and prevent with that inflammation from occurring later on. This is where our corticosteroids are going to become super important here to, in order to prevent that from occurring. Okay, So this is going to come up again.
you can kind of see here, once uh, the allergen is able to activate our T cells, we get a lot of cytokine production. Again, both, uh, you know, a lot of mast cell degranulation here leading to things like the mucus plug, uh, bronchial uh, constriction, all that leading to uh, poor airway transmission, uh, decrease, you know, uh, you get these VQ mismatches that occur, all that fun stuff. Uh, so this is what we're going to be trying to, to reverse. And again, it's always better if you can prevent these acerbations from having in the first place rather than trying to play catch up, right? So again, this is why patients, um, you really wanna make sure they're well controlled maintenance therapy if they need it. Uh, and that way they really have to very sparingly use their rescue medication, right? I remember when I was a little kid growing up, as I mentioned, I'd use my rescue inhaler all the time. It was in my pocket. It was like my EpiPen, right? No, I don't actually use an EpiPen, but if I was, had, did have an anaphylactic reaction or something, that's how close I'd have it on me. Once I actually got on decent controller medication, I was actually on an inhaled corticosteroid, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I didn't, I didn't have to carry that around anymore. It was like a freaking, you know, just like my life had changed practically. They didn't have to have this thing on me all the time. Uh, so again, it's really, really important. Again, quality of life can really be affected by this because having asthma exacerbations is, is not fun. So anyway, so the pathogenesis, uh, again, kind of been alluding to it, but these allergens are promoting that IgE production. This will become important for one particular drug and a little bit later we'll talk about. Um, but by having the IgE, it's going to activate a lot of these inflammatory cells. And then by having this re-exposure, you're going to have this release of histamine, tryptase, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, all these inflammatory mediators. So we're really going to try to be um, either preventing this from actually occurring in the first place with a lot of our maintenance therapies, or once an exacerbation has already happened, um, we're going to go ahead and try to use some quick acting medications to uh, kind of reverse the effects of these already being released. So again, uh, that, those mediators released in the mast cells are going to lead to this kind of vascular leakage. So again, that's why you get this kind of edematous kind of effect here, as we can see, that, um, again, that acute bronchoconstriction occurring here as well. And it's that early phase we mentioned here. And then later on, you get the more of that sustained phase three to six hours later. It's called a late asthmatic response. And again, this is going to be much more kind of sustained, kind of long, longer lasting kind of bronchoconstriction than you see really in that early phase. So um, we know there's lots of causes for it. Does anyone know any causes for asthma exacerbations? Cold air can be one, for sure. That's why, again, in the wintertime months, exercise can be one. A viral illness can do this as well. You know, someone gets a viral illness, all of a sudden kind of kicks their asthma into overdrive. Um, just, hmm? just, yeah, just allergens in the air, so like pollen. Uh, if you work in particular uh, industrial type of areas, sometimes you, know, you can have actual industrial chemicals you can be breathing in that can trigger asthma. So lots of different things can do this. Um, and basically what we're going to be seeing is that um, uh, because of that, you're going to notice uh, kind of in general this drop in this force export expiratory volume over one second, or FEV1. That's primarily the big thing we're going to see. Because again, when you have that bronchial constriction, um, it's hard to force that air out because basically you kind of like kind of kink, put a kink in the hose essentially, and you can't have as much flow coming out. It's just one of the primary things you're going to notice kind of first off. And you guys covered um, uh, your pulmonary function tests already? Good. So you guys already have plenty about that. And actually, it's kind of interesting. This is one of the things we'll do. Um, uh, and actually, to diagnose someone with asthma, occasionally, and we did this more like for some of our research patients, but to make sure they actually have asthma, we had to check to see how responsive they were to some of these um, uh, to some of these effects. And so we'd actually use a drug called methacholine. We'd actually breathe in, and that would trigger an asthmatic response in susceptible individuals. And if they saw that response, they saw their FEV1 drop, they would say, okay, well, you're likely have asthma, and we can reverse it with something like albuterol. So we can actually test patients uh, for that. Anyway, so again, um, the bronchoconstriction results may not always be directly from the, those kind of release mediators. Um, you can also have these kind of neural, kind of humoral pathways as well. But again, um, things like, you know, substance P can even have a response here. These kind of tachykinins, we call them, that all stimulate smooth muscle constriction. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, so because of these kind of multiple pathways, this is why we use drugs of different mechanisms, right? So again, going back to the mechanisms, we want to look for synergy here. We look for things that are going to work on different parts of the pathway in order to make sure our patients are well controlled or we can reverse these kind of acute exacerbations. So our therapeutic approaches, initially we like to reverse bronchospasm if it's present. This is where we're going to see our beta-2 agonist. This is where we're also going to see things like our anticholinergics. So this is going to be a quick-acting anticholinergic we'll talk about a little bit later. Again, remember, anticholinergics are working on um, what type of receptors? Muscarinic, right? So we're preventing acetylcholine from interacting with muscarinic receptors. Because you think like your rest, digest, kind of nervous system, that parasympathetic effect. Um, typically, what does that do to secretions? Increases, yeah. So again, acetylcholine affecting muscarinic receptors increases secretions, increases that uh, bronchoconstriction. This is why we use anticholinergics here. So we'll look at that a little bit later. And also, it's kind of old school drug called theophylline, which we don't use very much anymore, but I'll mention here for uh, completeness sake. 
We'll also look at things uh, that can help us to remove the trigger or the antigen. So this will include things like uh, some of our mast cell stabilizers. We'll talk about in a, few, a little bit later. And then we'll have some things that can control inflammation. This is where steroids come into play. This is also where our lipoxygenase inhibitors. This is an enzyme we're going to see is really important for producing leukotrienes. So uh, again, I mentioned the asthma hypersensitivity test. Basically, uh, methylcholine actually activates those muscarinic receptors. So people who happen to be susceptible, they have a, a basically a bronchoconstriction or that has a response to that. Basically, if they see a drop in their FEV1 in 20%, then you know, yeah, they're positively affected by that. Yes, they, they have asthma, essentially. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, I think Mike was showing you guys a, a table that kind of looked a little similar to this. Um, you classify asthma based on the symptomatology, right? So you look at things like, you know, how often are they having symptoms? How often are they waking up in the middle of the night? Uh, and, so, and how often are they using their rescue inhalers, right? So all these are kind of leading to the thing like, okay, well, is it intermittent? Is it very infrequent that they have this? Or is it much more persistent, right? And if it is persistent, if it is much more reliable, how often is it occurring? You know, how severe are the symptoms? I'm not going to get specific into asking you whether this person has intermittent versus moderate you know, persistent, but I will ask you, you know, which types of treatments are going to be better for those type of patients, right? So again, if I had, you know, long-term controller medications, probably not going to be super great for these intermittent patients versus, you know, having to utilize more therapies for that as uh, symptoms get more severe. So we'll look at those more in detail, but just realize that it has to go not only your PFTs, but also symptomatology is kind of guiding you to decide just how severe their asthma is. So our goals here, we want to reduce that level of bronchial responsiveness in the long term. Um, so again, this is going to be related to airway inflammation. So we can deal with the inflammation, we can decrease that responsiveness um, of the bronchial smooth muscle. And so this is where we're going to be reducing it with anti-inflammatory agents. Okay? Primarily, we're going to see that um, you can utilize both systemic corticosteroids, uh, and you can also use inhaled corticosteroids. What do you think would be the difference in side effects between the two? Which one you're more likely to get like systemic side effects? Systemic. Probably systemic corticosteroids, right? So it's as simple as it sounds. And that you know, if, you, if I give you an oral uh, steroid, if I give you an IV steroid, you're more likely to see the systemic effects. The benefit of giving inhaled corticosteroids is straight to, straight to the lungs, no big side effects, right? There's gonna be some unique side effects, but uh, you're gonna limit a lot of those things like the change in mental status, the increase of glucose, the intraocular pressure, all those different things like that. You had mentioned, um, I think, among corticosteroids being a that would be process. more of the inhaled certainly you could do it with systemic but because of the side effects you would never do that right um that would be a kind of a benefit versus risk kind of thing where giving systemic steroids while effective the, the side effects would make that really kind of untenable right on the other hand if you're having like a really bad acute exacerbation that's where using systemic steroids because they're going to work a little bit faster um are going to be really important right did they ever in the past do that because my grandmother used to take oral they did that before we had the, the inhaled corticosteroids. Okay. That would have been one option, right? That's when they were using like theophylline and, and things like that. But yeah, that would have been the, the alternative because, you know, it, that's all they had. yeah, that's all they had, yeah, essentially. Um, so anyway, so then we uh, deal with that inflammation, and then we're going to look to try to prevent or reverse the acute bronchospasm. Obviously, uh, patient education is really important. If they can avoid certain allergens, so like for me, just don't go around cats. Mm -hmm. Sounds easy enough, right? Except for that girlfriend I had for three years who had two cats and... Sometimes the heart, you can't choose that sort of thing, right? So patients aren't going to listen to you. But anyway, if you can avoid the allergens, that is important, right? Um, you avoid those triggers, and then also you're going to be treating those symptoms with uh, short-term beta-2 agonists. So again, quick relief medications. This is going to include our short-acting beta-2 agonist. This is different than our long-acting beta agonists, as we're going to see in a minute. We're going to have our anticholinergics and then systemic corticosteroids. These are going to be faster acting than the inhaled ones are going to be, okay? So these are quick relief. So if you had a severe asthma exacerbation, these are the kind of drugs you're going to be getting, right? Less severe exacerbations, you'll probably just be getting the beta-2 agonists. Long-term controller medications are going to be more focused on long-term either prevention of bronchoconstriction or preventing that inflammation, okay? So this is where our long-acting beta-2 agonists are going to come into play. Inhaled corticosteroids, these two are going to be kind of the cornerstone of maintenance therapy. And then we're going to look at things like leukotriene modifiers, mast cell stabilizers. These almost never get used. Um, Anti-IgE antibodies. This is actually a kind of a unique one that we use uh, with some frequency for some of our kids over at Nemours. And then we'll talk about methyl xanthines, theophylline. Um, you guys, any know? Uh, any of you guys know any of the any drugs or any chemicals that are very similar to methyl xanthine, like theophylline? Most of you guys are probably consumed. Most of you probably have near lethal levels of it in your blood right now. Caffeine, caffeine yeah. So actually, caffeine and theophylline 
are very, very similar. So we actually used to use caffeine inhalers uh, to treat asthma exacerbation way back in the day, right? Uh, because we knew that had actually we used to use methamphetamine uh, inhalers as well, but we don't fortunately utilize those anymore. But this, they were pretty fun. Anywho, so focusing first on beta-2 agonists, again, these are uh, going to have both short-acting and long-acting varieties here. Uh, main thing they're going to be doing by activating the beta-2 receptors that increase cyclic AMP. Do you guys remember that from secondary messengers a long time ago? Yeah, anyway, they're going to upregulate that. Cyclic AMP is going to be increased, and that will lead to smooth muscle relaxation. That's the biggest thing here, right? So beta-2 agonists cause smooth muscle relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle, okay? Short acting typically going to work very rapidly within minutes and typically last for around four to six hours or so. Okay, long acting ones, as we'll see, are going to last 12 hours or more. Okay, uh, which is a nice benefit there. Again, their onset is going to be a lot slower, but they last for a long period of time, which is nice. Um, big side effects you're going to see: increased heart rate, tremor are going to be the, the big thing. Especially with the the long acting ones, you don't really see this quite so much, but the short acting ones for sure. You know, tremulousness, anxiety, tachycardia; those are kind of the most common things. So again, as you might imagine here, this is a uh, smooth muscle cell. Uh, again, if you were looking at a beta-2 receptor being activated, that G protein, you guys remember that, um, gets activated and cyclic AMP will actually help to prevent this uh, smooth, muscle, uh, react, uh, smooth muscle activation from happening here. So basically, um, you get some sort of cover muscle physiology like the actin and myosin and all that good stuff. All right, so basically it prevents that. It helps to, to release that and relax that smooth muscle cell. So uh, the two main beta-2 agonists are going to be albuterol. It's the primary one we're going to use as kind of our workhorse beta-2 agonist. You know, it's have one called levalbuterol. What do you think the relationship is between these two? Yeah, it's kind of the left-handed version of albuterol, and so it's called Zopinex. Um, very, very expensive compared to albuterol, and actually, I never recommend it. Some people say, well, I get side effects from albuterol. I just say cut the dose of the albuterol if you're, you know, um, I'm not going to do my soapbox here, but just know I don't really like the Zopinex too much. But I'll at least uh, mention it here because if you see it, you'll, you'll know. Because some patients will come in and be like, well, I don't want your, I don't want your albuterol. I only use my Zopinex. And I was like, well, okay, whatever. Like, sometimes you can't, you can't rationalize people's drug decisions, but that's okay. We also have a couple long-acting form. And again, these are not to be used alone for asthma. They actually did some studies that tried using this in asthmatic patients by themselves and actually caused increased mortality. We don't know why, but they just don't want to be used by themselves. The only time you'll see these used by themselves are going to be for COPD patients, which we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but things like Fomoterol and Somiterol, the two primary ones you're going to see here. And again, these are oftentimes not used by themselves. You're going to see there's some combination drugs, uh, and those are going to be more appropriate for your asthmatic patients. Adverse effects, we mentioned tachycardia. Potentially hypotension, you really don't see it all that too often, but that would be like with those really kind of big doses. Um, think about it, a person coming in for an asthma exacerbation, they're getting big doses via this nebulizer. They're just kind of inhaling a ton of the stuff. Um, those are more likely to see kind of these cardiovascular effects. Um, obviously, some headache, dizziness is kind of associated with that. And even uh, potentially hyperglycemia, because again, beta-2 receptors still exist on the liver. You end up seeing increased glucose. So that could be one potential side effect. Now, moving on from that, you also have our inhaled corticosteroids, right? So these are going to be really good for maintenance therapy. These are going to be good for helping to prevent an uh, exacerbation from happening in the first place, right? So these are going to include things like beclomethazone, uh, budesonide. Do you remember where we saw these before? Like in the ENT section? These also have nasal corticosteroids, right? So again, these uh, are very easy to mix up, I mentioned, um, because if you get, you know, flow nase versus flow vent mixed up, you know, it's very easy to, to screw that up. And I know... Plenty of times, uh, you know, pharmacists signed off on the wrong one because we didn't read the label appropriately. Um, but, you know, these, again, are going to have very similar effects as what we saw in the nose. They're just going to be working the lungs, okay? Um, Imetazone, triamcinolone for the ticazone. Um, these are all very, very common ones you're going to see being used. It really depends on what their insurance covers and depends on what's on formula at the institution you're at as, uh, as far as which one you're going to use, okay? So, again, these are working kind of at the top level to inhibit, uh, inhibit that inflammatory cascade, but really only working locally in the lungs, which is great. You don't really see a ton of systemic side effects, which is their main benefit over using a uh, systemic corticosteroid. The biggest adverse effects you're going to see, and this is really important for patient education, is oral candidiasis. Why do you think you can see a, because uh, again, uh, oral candidiasis is what type of infection? Yeast. Yeah, it's like a yeast infection. It's like a fungal infection. Why, why would you see that, do you think? Why would an inhaled corticosteroid cause that in the back of the throat? Well, yes, yeah, so you rinse your mouth in order to prevent that, but what's the mechanism there? Not the flora. What, do, uh, what does the corticosteroids do to your immune system? It's immunosuppressive, right? So you get a local immunosuppressive kind of effect there, which makes sense. So one of the education points we always tell people is make sure you wash your mouth after using it. 
Was I guilty of not doing that very often? Yes, I was, but I never got thrush, fortunately. But for patients who are maybe immunocompromised to begin with, they are more uh, predisposed to this, and those patients tend to be more likely to see uh, fungal or you know systemic effects uh, from that. You know, the fungus may start there, but it may uh, spread potentially depending on how good their immune system is. So um, again, oral candidiasis is kind of a classic thing you hear with inhaled corticosteroids. Um, there's some risk if uh, there's some theoretical risk in suppressing growth in children with really high doses. Clinically, this is not really a big concern. And then um, again, clinically, you don't really see it inhibiting the immune system, but it is a theoretical concern with really high doses. You could see some systemic effect because you still have some absorption for the lungs, which is pretty limited for the most part. Note here, you may need to up to eight weeks to really see maximal effects. So this is the big thing I always tell people is that this is not going to work immediately. It's going to take time to kick in. The other thing is, is that, yeah, like, you know, you, you may take this when you have, like, I say, a respiratory virus or something, you have an asthma exacerbation. Uh, if I stop taking it, is it going to continue to work? No. So that's the problem is a lot of patients will feel better. They'll stop, you know, stop taking it, and then all of a sudden their asthma comes back just as bad as it was before. They need to be consistent with this. If they're not going to be consistent, no point in using it, okay? The big thing you'll see uh, nowadays, there's probably even more of these because I feel this is like a big blockbuster, almost sort of uh, group of drugs where you're seeing a lot of new ones coming out all the time. Um, they're mixing a long acting beta agonist like Fomoderol or Salmeterol plus one of these inhaled corticosteroids, right? So Advair is a really big one. Simbacort is another big one. I'm sure you've seen lots of commercials for that. This can be used for both COPD and for asthma, but primarily it kind of got its start with, with asthma therapy. So the benefit is, is that while the corticosteroids take a long time to kick in, like can take up to a couple of weeks, you had the long acting beta agonist is going to be relatively effective kind of immediately in providing kind of that, that uh, 12 hour kind of relief essentially, right? So that's why it's going to have a little bit faster action, even though it's mixed in with a corticosteroid, which takes a while. And typically these are given like twice a day, so that way you kind of get full 24 hour coverage. Makes sense? You still want to wash your mouth out after these um, because again, you worry about that thrush risk from the corticosteroid. Go with me. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it there. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I let you guys go? All right, um, again, if you have any questions, issues, problems with the quiz, I think I just hit the button to show the assignment, so that should be available. That will be due the next test. The quiz is gonna be due next week. Uh, again, you guys are on the honor system. Do your best. Uh, I cannot answer the questions for you directly, but if you have like logistical questions, feel free to write me and I will try to answer those. Yes, ma'am. So are we completing this now, like voiceover or next class? Oh, we'll finish this uh, the next class and then uh, go move on to cardio. Cool. All right, thanks.